This morning, we're going to talk about the flip side. The idea behind the flip side is basically this idea of God taking us and flipping our world upside down, taking us beyond our own understanding, beyond our own comprehension. Sometimes when I'm trying to come up with an illustration or an idea um, to show a point, I'll go to my wife and I'll say, think of a story about when this happened. So I went to her this week and I said, I need a story about a time when I was just dead set convinced I was right about something and it turned out I was wrong. Now let me tell you the good news. Her response was, I can't think of anything. Yeah, right? Yeah. That's what every husband in here wants to hear. Now she'll think of something eventually and she'll bring it to my attention pretty vividly, I'm sure. But the story that did come to both of our minds, and I have her permission to tell, I would have told even if I didn't, but I have her permission to tell, is a story of one time we went to the bank. We were, we were at the, you know, the drive through at the bank. We were going to deposit a check or something. Pulled up and I noticed there was a, a truck in the lane next to us that had um, a, a dog in the back of it. And I just made mention that, oh, that's nice. One time when I was here, I saw that the bank will give out dog biscuits to, to the dog. You know, kind of like if, if your parents, when you go through the bank, they'll give like a sucker to the little kids in the back or something like that. Well, I said, they give out dog biscuits. Well, you have to understand our history. I like to tell my wife things that are not true just to show her how gullible she is. And so she was just convinced that this was one of those times. They do not give out dog biscuits. They do. I, I swear to you, they give out dog biscuits. They do not. They do. They do not. They do. So, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to ask for a dog biscuit. If they give me one, you have to eat it. <laughs> I only made her eat half of the dog biscuit. I'm a nice guy. I'm a, I'm a good husband, good loving husband. You can talk to her later and see what they taste like. Um, I don't think the commercials are quite accurate for, you know, how savory and delicious they are. That's actually one of my, Peyton, my six-year-old, that's one of her favorite stories to ask us to tell her. Tell me about the time mom made a dog biscuit. Okay. This has happened to all of us at one time or another, right? We've, we've thought, we've been dead set that we are right about something. This is the right way to go. This is the right thing to do. And then we come to a point in life where we go, oh, maybe I was a little off on that. This is actually really common in stories among influential Christians throughout history. Um, Ignatius is the writer of a book that's influenced millions and millions of Christians um, since he wrote it over 500 years ago. And he was actually a, a very brave um, warrior, and, and he had aspirations to become a, a, a leading military figure. And th these were his dreams. He he talks in some of his writings of, of actually sitting and daydreaming and, and envisioning himself as this leading military, you know, leader. And that all kind of came to an end from one day because a cannonball actually hit him and shattered his leg. So as he laid in the infirmary after that, he was bored out of his mind. He was trying to figure out what he could do with his time. And he asked the, the nurses or whoever were there for some books. I thought this was funny. What he asked for were romance novels. And I thought that was funny for a brave warrior. He wanted romance novels. And they said, well, we don't have any romance novels. We only have two books in the entire, in, in the entire infirmary. And one of them was a Bible. The other, a book on spiritual growth. He said, well, bring them here. He started to read them. And as he began flipping through the pages and as he began absorbing the words of this book, all of a sudden he, he said, I always had these dreams of being this, this leading figure, this, this person that people looked up to, but that was so, that was so fleeting. It, it, was, it was like as I was thinking about it, as I was daydreaming, I would be excited. My heart would beat fast, but even as soon as I walked away from it, it was just like this letdown. But he said, as I started reading the pages of this book, what I found was a deeper calling, a calling that I started to recognize as this relationship with Christ, and that what I recognized in that was this stirring within me that not only happened as I was reading the pages, but that would continue, and my mind would continue to race on these things. Ignatius completely changed his path, and he wrote a book called The Spiritual Exercises, which remains to this day one of the foundational works 
of spiritual disciplines that we have in the Christian faith. C.S. Lewis was an atheist before he became one of the great apologists and one of the great Christian minds of the 20th century. Writing of his own conversion story, Lewis called, called himself the most, reluctant, the most reluctant convert in all of England. As he searched as a critic of this faith, as he searched it to understand why people believed this, he found this depth, this understanding, and this reality in this faith. Now C.S. Lewis is probably one of the most read and most quoted authors that we have in Christianity. Josh McDowell was on the fast track to law school. Um, I've seen Josh speak live before, and, and he talks about how one of his spiritual gifts is to argue. He's a very good arguer. And he decided to use his gift of argument, his gift of debate, maybe you'd say, and he decided to use that to prove wrong all of his annoying friends who believed in Jesus. He couldn't stand how they talked about it, and it just drove him nuts. So he went and applied his ability to research and his ability to argue to hundreds and hundreds of hours, digging through the scriptures, digging through even outside sources, science, philosophy, all these things. And as he dug in and he, did, and he started to discover who Jesus was, he said, and this is a quote, he discovered compelling, overwhelming, overwhelming evidence for the reliability of the Christian faith. You can read some of his discoveries in his book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. One more, Lee Strobel was a cynical investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Um, he had something really annoying happen one day where his wife gave her heart to the Lord. And all of a sudden, she started coming home from church and telling him about Jesus. And he hated it. And all I wanted to do was shut his wife up. He just wanted her to leave him alone. So he decided to put his energy, his, his passion, and he started doing investigative reporting, researching to prove this Jesus, this story wrong. He's now a leading Christian apologist and has written several, five, six, seven, eight books that show the very logic behind God's existence, the very logic behind the stories of Jesus in this book being true and not being made up. These were all people who had had a track. They had something they just knew was right, and they were headed in that direction until God came, flipped their world upside down, blew their mind, and changed their thinking. I like to call these flip side stories. God does this, where he comes in, he, he takes us, we're on a track, we have, we have our own understanding and our own thoughts, and he just kind of tosses a little dose of himself in, into the mix, and our minds are blown. We thought we got it, and all of a sudden, our minds are just completely blown. Paul writes to the Corinthians about this when he says, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. Isn't that comforting? Our wisdom is foolishness to God. Anything we could achieve on our own, any, any depth of understanding, any contextual, you know, understanding, it's foolishness to God. Now, I'm, I'm a pretty big component for Christian education. Um, I'm spending a lot of money on it right now, so I better be a pretty big component of it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a seminary student. But this is one of those things that grabs us and tells us that this faith, Christianity, is about more than education. It's about more than knowledge. It has to be about more than knowledge. I, I, for, for my studies, I have to do a lot of research. I'm, I'm in the process of writing a, a master's thesis now, so I'm digging into scholarly articles and, and commentaries and all this stuff. And, and um, I'm, I'm a dork, so I love this kind of stuff. So don't feel bad for me. If I could do this all day, I would, I would actually be plum content. But I, one of the things that I've been amazed at as, as I've dug into this more and more is the number of biblical scholars. I mean, guys who know this book front to back, they, they know the information on this and the context of what it says. And, and, you know, 
everything. I mean, and their level of knowledge is insane, but how many of those biblical scholars have a, a head knowledge and almost maybe even, I mean, some of them definitely zero heart knowledge. They get this book. They understand the history. They understand the ideas in it, but they don't feel like they relate to them on a heart level. We got to be careful we're not like that, right? We don't want to become the guy who knows this book front to back, but doesn't know what this book means to me in one single verse. And yet that's, that's a danger. We want the flip side, where God takes us beyond our own understanding, beyond what we can comprehend in our own foolish minds. Before the Apostle Paul was the Apostle Paul, which think about who the Apostle Paul was. He wrote most of the New Testament, or much of the New Testament. Um, you take basically Romans through, I think we're looking like Colossians area, it's, that whole chunk. I mean, you're, you're looking at the Apostle Paul over and over and over again. And he's writing these as letters to churches that he started because he went, he started all these churches around first century um, area there. But before he was the Apostle Paul, he was a devout Jewish Pharisee that went by his Hebrew name, Saul. <clears throat> As a Pharisee, Saul would have trained devoutly, intensely in understanding and memorizing the Torah and the scriptures. The Torah is the Jewish law, first five books of the Old Testament. But these guys would spend hours upon hours upon hours upon hours studying, memorizing, applying the scriptures, applying the law. When I was in Israel this, this summer, we saw um, the Orthodox Jews around a lot, and they're very distinct because of their, their, their dress and everything. But um, one of the things that was amazing to see is they would stand, you know, we'd, we'd see them at bus stops, at um, you know, waiting at a restaurant, waiting, you know, wherever. And we would see these, these Orthodox Jews and they would be standing there. There's a book just, just about the size of two smartphones. You know, so just kind of the palm of your hands. And they carry these books with them everywhere. And they would just sit there and just intensely, they're reading. And you could tell they're reading, but then they're also reciting and they're working on memorizing. And I mean, it was, it was a thick book. And it, this was the Hebrew scripture. And they're walking around because they, their goal is not just to know it, not just to understand it, but that this is what they live, this is what they breathe, this is what they eat. This is everything to them. Well, that would have been Saul as a Pharisee. He knew the scriptures inside and out. In fact, we'll see that later when you read his, his writings. It's insane how much Paul understood the scripture, how, how much knowledge, how much head knowledge he had of that. That was Saul's life. Saul studied as, to be a Pharisee under a rabbi, which is just a word for a teacher, but he studied under this teacher, and his name was Gamaliel. Gamaliel was very respected. We see him pop up a few times in, in scripture and kind of see his, his position among the rabbis in the area. He was very respected, but he was also the grandson of one of the great, one of the most revered rabbis in the history. In, in fact, one of the writers of some of the the commentary on the Jewish law was Rabbi Hillel, and Gamaliel is actually his grandson. So think about Paul's track here. He is somebody who is intensely involved in studying as a Pharisee. But not only that, but he's studying under a teacher who is one of the most respected teachers and who is in the line of potentially one of at least one of two of the most respected rabbis in the history of all of Israel. He's on the fast track to a place of respect, to a place where he is going to be revered himself. And to be someone who is destined for great things as a Pharisee at that time would have seemed to have been someone who was destined for great things with God. Because these were seen as some of the men who were closest to God. Saul was passionate he was dedicated, he was committed, and he thought he was doing all those things for the, right, for the right thing, and he was passionate about the right thing. 
But here's what we, and here's what we find at the beginning of Acts 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, meaning Christianity, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. That's kind of a weird turn here. How in the world could Saul think he was on the right path, he was doing the right thing, he was in God's will, when we read right here, he's breathing threats, of, threats and murder against Christianity. We just don't think of Saul as somebody, I think this is an interesting place to start, because we don't think of Saul as somebody, as a follower of God. He's the persecutor of the church. He's the one going around killing him, killing them. We, we see in, in the story of Stephen, the first martyr, we see those who stone Stephen, we see them throw their cloaks at the feet of Saul, meaning that that was a sign of respect, and they would have looked to him to be somebody that they, that they were getting his approval on that. How could he be somebody who would have thought he was following God in that moment? Paul thought that by persecuting and eventually eliminating this movement called Christianity, that he was doing the work of God. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But first, I want to hit Paul's flip side moment. Because Paul, in the next three verses, we see Paul's flip side moment where everything turns on its head for Paul. He's been passionately moving in a direction, and now God comes in and just whacks him over the head and everything changes. So in verses 3 through 5, we read, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. God flipped Saul's idea of who God is. Saul would have grown up as a, as a Jewish youth and into his, adult, his adulthood throughout his entire life, reciting a prayer called the Shema. The Shema is actually taken from the Old Testament. It's, it's biblical. And it's taken from there. And the first line of the Shema reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. Monotheism is the, the big word for that. It means one God. Mono, one, theism, God. The belief in one God. This was one of the, the most key things, and it is one of the most key points of the Old Testament. As we read it today, we see this over and over and over again, that God makes this point very clear, that there is one God. There is one living God. And guess what? We believe that too. And thanks to Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul, we actually end up with our very well-rounded idea of the Trinity. Now, if you ever want to get a headache, try to understand the Trinity. Um, it, it, this is one of those things that's just beyond us, our, our understanding. We can't quite wrap our head around it. Because the idea is, is that there's one God, three persons, three personalities. You'll hear some... Um, pastors, teachers talk about the idea of an egg where, you know, there's the shell, there's the white and the yolk. It's all the egg, but there's three different parts. Um, I had a discussion in one of my classes this week that talked about a verse in Colossians that, that talks about the fullness of, of God being in Jesus. So in, in all of the different ways that, that people, both good and bad, have interpreted that over the years, the Trinity is really, really hard to understand. Um, but we do understand that we worship one God in three persons. But you can understand then why Saul, a devout Pharisee, who grew up not only reciting the Shema twice a day, every day for his entire life, and saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Not only did he do that, but this was a guy that was actually teaching. He was providing the commentary on these kinds of things. He was providing the messages like this that didn't just say that, but, but emphasize that over and over and over again. So now imagine him. He hears about this guy named Jesus. Um, we, we have no evidence, and, and in fact, we're, we're fairly certain that, that, that Saul never would have encountered Jesus in, in bodily form on earth. Um, 
And then you hear him, or, or then he, but he starts hearing about him. Jesus is crucified. He hears rumors that they're saying he's been raised from the dead. And then people start referring to him as the son of God. Now, how would that have hit Saul's ears? The Lord our God is one. But you're talking about a son of God. That sounds like a second God to me. So when Saul starts attacking and persecuting the church, I, I wholeheartedly believe he thought he was doing the work of God. He thought he was doing what he was supposed to be doing because this new faith, it didn't even have the name of Christianity yet, but we'll, that's what we call it, so we'll go with Christianity. This new faith called Christianity was a threat to the one living God. And Saul's saying, Nope, this has got to be taken care of. And I am passionate and I know I'm right. I'm getting rid of this. And he went on a mission to do just that. God flipped Saul's idea of who God is. I don't know about you, but there have been a lot of times in my life where I've, I thought I had the right idea and I've been just going after that. I've been going after that. And all of a sudden, I come to a different point in my life, and I, and I, I, I either learn something new, or I, or I see it from a different angle, or whatever. And all of a sudden, I go, wow, I was wrong. I really missed that. That's what happens to Paul, or Saul here. And one of the things I love about it is, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we have to be careful here, because there's a lot of flipped out ideas out there about God, Right? Not flip side, but flipped out ideas. And we could walk out of this room today and we could discover new ideas about God. <laughs> Just go Google <laughs> and you'll find all sorts of interesting ideas. But we know as Christians that this is our standard, right? The Bible's our standard. If, if, if the idea doesn't line up, if it doesn't line up with Scripture, then we have to scrap it. We have to say, no, that's, that doesn't line up with what God teaches me in his word. So for Saul, when he becomes encountered with this idea, think of his mind because he's, he's memorized. He's, he has absorbed the scripture to the point that he's going, but wait, this doesn't line up. But yet, all of a sudden, what starts to happen is that Jesus starts to work in Saul's heart and in his mind to where he starts to see all of this differently. And he starts to see it through the lens of Jesus. And do you know what he discovers? He discovers that all the Old Testament law, all the Old Testament scripture, all the Old Testament prophets, they were pointing to something all along. There was something in the background that they didn't understand at that point. But now when he looks at it and he understands who Jesus is, all of a sudden he says, oh, Jesus is here. And Jesus is here. And this was pointing to Jesus. And this was looking toward Jesus. And he has this whole new understanding and in fact, some of his writings, Romans, I'm in a class right now going through Romans. If you've come to Heather's Bible study on Romans, the book of Romans is insane. The, 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 the level of his understanding. Um, and there are things you read where your mind is kind of going, wow, I'm going to just have to sit on this for a few days to see if I can, I can understand this. But what he sees is he sees the Old Testament coming to life through Jesus. So he actually did just what we're talking about. He went back to the scripture and said, but how does this work? And what he discovered is it definitely does work. I think that's just an incredible story of how God literally flipped Saul's idea of who God is. He had a very, very strong idea of who God was, and yet God just comes in and says, I've got a new revelation for you. And that would be incredible in itself, but there's another flip side story in these verses. Acts 9.10, we're introduced to a new character. It says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, and he said Here I am, Lord. We'll stop there. There's obviously more to the story. But there's two things I want to look there. A disciple at Damascus. Now, a disciple, we tend to think of a disciple as someone who follows, follows somebody. You know, they, they, they listen to them, they understand them, um, you know, they do all those things. And that's true. 
But the actual, the word, if you go back to the Greek for disciple, is apostolos, which is the, the literal meaning to that is one who is sent out. It's one who is sent out as a representative of that teacher. So that means that to be a disciple, you, you first by, you know, start by following. You start by, by listening, by learning, by following in their feet. But ultimately, the goal is, is that you learn and you, you are so close to them that you actually become a representative of their teacher. My, my dad always used to use this illustration, and so I, I emailed him this week and asked him to, to give me some background on it. But there's actually an old um, Jewish saying out there that says that a disciple is somebody covered in the dust of their rabbi, of their teacher. And what they actually mean by that is that you literally follow that, that teacher so closely and you, you are so in step with them that you're being covered by the dust as it stirs up as they walk. That's the picture of what a disciple is. Ananias was a disciple. He was someone who was such a close, such an intense follower of Jesus that he now was someone who represented him, someone who stood for him. Then we see that he was in Damascus. When I was in Israel this summer, I, I got to go for, for school. I did not get to go to Damascus because Damascus is in Syria. That's not a place we were able to go. Um, but we did get to go close to it. We were up close to the border and they pointed to the direction it was. We actually saw the street that we'll reference here in, um, pretty soon in our, in our verses. But it's interesting because a lot of the area of you know, Israel and the Middle East, it's, it's fairly close together. You're kind of surprised when you go there how close things are. Um, we're, we're driving from, we were driving in Jerusalem one day, and it was our first or second day, and our professor pointed out the window and he said, oh, over there you'll see Bethlehem. And literally, over there is Bethlehem. You know, I, I always thought Bethlehem was like Rapid City from here. But no, it's over there. I mean, it's just really close. But Damascus is a good distance away. Um, in fact, the, the most conservative estimates I found showed that Damascus is about a six to seven day walk from Jerusalem. That's a long trip, right? I was trying to think about a six to seven day drive from Sioux Falls. Where would you end up? Probably depends on how, how much you want to drive in a day, I suppose. But you'd end up a long ways away. It's a long trip. There actually, most scholars actually believe that Ananias and the other um, Christians who were in Damascus at that time would have been there from fleeing from Jerusalem. They would have fled when Saul and the other persecutors started to hunt them. They would have fled there to save their lives, basically. So think about that. They flee a six, at least a six to seven day journey away from where the persecution is happening. They got to feel kind of secure there, right? They got to feel pretty safe. They've gotten away from, you know, the, the front lines of the battle, six to seven um, days away. And I can just imagine that Ananias daily counted his blessings and said, God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for letting me come here where I can be safe, where I can be secure in my faith in you, and I don't have to live surrounded by persecution. I don't have to live in the middle of that. He still hears the reports of what are happening. He still hears all the ugly stuff happening back in Jerusalem. We'll hear that in just a minute. But it would seem that Ananias believes and is thankful that God has saved him from harm. He's secure in Damascus. But then God comes and flips his story upside down. Acts 9, 11 through 14 says, And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. That's the one that I saw. And at the house of Judas, look for a man, named Tar or a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But I love this. Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. God flipped Ananias' idea of security. He was secure. He was safe. He was protected. He was insulated 
from what was happening in Jerusalem. And now it's, it's coming his direction, and God says, hey, instead of hiding from it, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and find it. I want you to go to that guy. You know, the one that you've been seeing on the evening news lately who's been killing all the Christians? I want you to go to him because he's praying, and I want you to pray for him that he regains his sight. Now, can you imagine Ananias' response? Uh, what was the name of that guy, God? Um, yeah, I've heard about him. He's, he's not a nice guy. I've heard about some of the things he's been doing to friends of mine back home. Why is it again I would go to find him? I've always wondered what Ananias was doing just before this point. You know, the scripture doesn't, isn't written like a novel. We don't get all the little details. But what was Ananias doing just before the Lord came and told him this? Was he, was he playing with his kids? Was he, you know, checking in on some work responsibilities? Maybe he was trying to charm his wife or, or dig himself out of a hole with his wife. Who knows? Was he checking his fantasy football team? You know, what, what was Ananias doing at this point? Because he, he had it good. He was secure. He was safe. Things were happy. He had a happy life at this point. And then God comes and flips his world upside down. He went from total security to total submission. Total security to total submission. God flipped Ananias' idea of security on its head. Another incredible story, but to me, the most incredible words of this entire chapter, Acts chapter 9, come in these next few verses. Acts 9, 15 through 16. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for Saul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Listen to this. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. For the sake is... Uh, is a purpose clause in, in Greek. It's huper. The whole idea is this is the purpose of what you're doing. You must suffer for the sake of my name. Acts 9 is famously considered the, the main story, at least. There's a few different, a few different accounts that, that we get throughout Acts and then some of, some of Paul's letters. But it's the main and, and most famous story of Paul's conversion and calling. It's an awesome story. We see Paul, or Saul at this point, he's, he's walking down the road. He is, he is going to persecute. He, he has the letters from the chief priest saying he can bring these, these Christians back, can arrest them, bring them back, and then who knows what they'll do at that point. Nothing good. But he, he has the authority. He's on the path. He's on his way there. All of a sudden, a light shines. A voice speaks to him. He's converted, and we see from then out one of the greatest stories in Christian history we have is the Apostle Paul. His ministry, his ability to go into to lands that had no understanding of Jesus and to explain it to them. And he talks about being all things to all people, his ability to do that, his ability to communicate. And without the Apostle Paul, where the Christian faith would have ended up, it's, I mean, God would have found someone else, but ultimately it's amazing what he was able to accomplish. And we see that story, and it's this amazing, exciting story. When I was first um, going through the, the process of becoming credentialed as a, as a minister, they, you go into the, like the state or the regional office, and they, they give you a binder that's, I mean, it's about that thick. It's a giant, giant binder, and it's just full of stuff you've got to go through, you've got to learn, you've got to memorize. Uh, there's three sections. One is like the history of the church and the polity of it. So the history, the history, understanding where you come from, the polity, understanding the leadership structure and all that kind of stuff. Um, next, you get into the doctrines so of the beliefs of the church and everything. So you go through and you read all that. Um, and then the last part being a section on scriptures, you know, important scriptures to, to know and understand and learn and memorize. And I remember I went through and I spent hours upon hours in this binder and memorizing it. There's no classes. You just, they just give you the binder and say, good luck. And, and you, good luck. You, you, you try. And so I, I remember doing it. I, I took the exam. Praise God, I, I passed it the first time. After that, you go and you do what they call an oral examination. 
where you sit in front of a panel of um, you know older not not older but older than you ministers um, who have been doing this and are are in leadership, and you sit before them and they start to ask you questions, and mainly what they're going to ask you about is your calling to ministry, and basically questions that that give them a gauge of whether you're you know you're ready to do this you know because even if you're called there sometimes is some some things you need to go through to to be prepared. And I remember sitting before that, and that was an interesting experience. But I remember years later when some of the the men who were on this panel were now peers of mine. I'd been a minister for several years, and I was at a, I was actually at lunch with them one day, and we were talking about that experience, that experience of sitting before that panel and sharing, you know, some of your heart and everything. And they said it was really interesting because and, and, and this isn't meant to, to judge anyone's calling story. I, I, you know, I sure wouldn't, wouldn't venture to do that. But it was interesting because there's one thing that almost every calling story has in common. And it's that I saw myself preaching to a room full of people. Nobody's ever called to an old, broken-down, half-empty, falling-apart church. We're all called to a room full of people. Now, I think there's probably reason for that beyond, you know, us wanting it to be that way. There's probably reason for that because God, God calls us to everyone and to, and to preach to the world. So, I mean, there's reason in that. But I just found it funny because even as we discussed it, we, we talked about some of our own experiences at that point and how really preaching to the half full room and the broken down church is actually more realistic in a lot of cases. But I think there's a reality for us when we want to relate to God's calling, we want to think if God calls us, then it's supposed to be successful. But we have to be careful how we define that word successful. If you ever want to get me on a soapbox issue where I won't shut up for a long time, talk to me about success in the church. Because this is one of my pet peeves. I think that success in the church is measured in faithfulness, not in butts in the seats. Can I say butts in the seats? I did. Success is measured in our faithfulness to God. And I think that's one of the keys that we see in this story with Saul in his calling. I was showing him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I can almost guarantee you that there were no calling stories before the panel that said, God called me and said, I want to show you how much you're going to suffer. And I ran right here so I could take the exam. (laughs) No, at that point they run away probably, right? But yet that's what the Lord is saying to Saul here. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. God flipped Saul's idea of purpose. Suffering isn't something we like to talk about. It's not something we like, you know, enjoy discussing. We like to think that life in God is the removal of suffering, that that God protects us who love him, you know, from suffering. I think he does sometimes. But we actually see in Scripture also a demonstration that he sometimes allows suffering and uses it for his purpose. I think we have to be careful. I'm not saying God inflicts suffering. I do think God allows suffering sometimes to be used for his purpose. This is one verse. The Apostle Paul is about to become the Apostle Paul. He's leaving behind his identity as Saul the persecutor so that he can become the Apostle Paul. But now he's about to see his purpose flipped upside down. The persecutor is about to become the persecuted. The persecutor is about to become the persecuted. I've done a lot of studies. One of my favorite areas of reading is, is in apologetic materials, which is basically the logical evidence behind, behind faith, behind Christianity. Um, and and I, I enjoy all that reading. I think there's a lot to it. I, you know, if we'll, as far as if we'll ever be able to 100% prove God's existence, that's up to him. It's not up to me. I'm, I guess I'm not worried to, I'm not concerned whether we do that because I know and I don't, you know, I don't need to be able to, to prove beyond that. 
But one of the most compelling evidences for, for Scripture as truth and for Jesus' life in particular as truth to me is the evidence that we see in the lives of those who are closest followers of Christ. Think about those who are closest to you. Do they know you a little differently from your coworkers? Do they know you a little differently from the person sitting next to you in church today? Yeah. They see you at home. They see you when you're stressed. They see you when you're going on three hours sleep for the week. They know the real you. Well, Jesus' closest followers spent day and night with him. They would have known him best. And how they lived after he was gone, in bodily form, after he was gone, how they lived is such incredible evidence to me. This is taken from Mark Batterson's All In. It says, in AD 44, King Herod ordered that James the Greater be thrust through with the sword. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred, and so the bloodbath began. Luke was hung by the neck from an olive tree in Greece. Doubting Thomas was pierced with a pine spear, tortured with red-hot plates, and burned alive in India. In AD 54, the proconsul of Hierapolis had Philip tortured and crucified because his wife converted to Christianity while listening to Philip preach. Philip continued to preach while on the cross. Matthew was stabbed in the back in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was flogged to death in Armenia. James the Just was thrown off the southeast pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. After surviving the 100-foot fall, he was clubbed to death by a mob. Simon the Zealot was crucified by a governor of Syria in AD 74. Judas Thaddeus was beaten to death with sticks in Mesopotamia. Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot, was stoned to death and then beheaded. And Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. He couldn't stand the, the idea of being killed in the same manner as Jesus. The only one of the twelve who was not killed a martyr's death was John, John the Beloved, author of the Gospel of John. I love John's story. John was thrown in a boiling cauldron of oil, but it didn't kill him. He survived. And that upset and freaked out the leaders so badly that they, they sent him away to the island of Patmos. They said, we don't even want you around anymore. We don't know what you're made of. These were the followers of Christ. These were the people who knew him best. They knew whether his life was anything worth standing for. And they said, not only is it worth standing for, it's worth suffering, it's worth dying for. And now we have the Apostle Paul. The man who would one day write such famous portions of Scripture as the fruit of the Spirit. He would write one of our most profound and famous um, writings anywhere on love. Love is patient. Love is kind. We can't go today. I was, I was reminded after service and in first service because they're closed. But tomorrow you could go to Hobby Lobby and buy a, hanging of, a, a wall hanging of that to put on your wall. The Apostle Paul gave us so much of our, of our faith in writing. And his calling is described as one connected with suffering. This is one of the hardest concepts in the entire Bible for me to, to relate with. Maybe not relate with, but to wrap my head around. I don't, I don't like to see people suffer. My mom talks often about how I used to bring strays home from school. She didn't mean pets. She meant kids. I used to, kids who were, were rejected, who were made fun of, who didn't have a lot of friends, my heart was broken for them. Um, I, I didn't have a problem making friends, but it broke my heart to see kids who had a problem making friends. So those kids became my friends, and they came home, and they played football and basketball and baseball with me after school. I've always had a place in my heart for those who are suffering, for those who are the outcasts, for those who are, are rejected. I'm naturally compassionate that way. And I struggle with suffering. I struggle with the idea of needing to suffer, but especially the idea of it being something that 
how do I word it? God is okay with. But then I read this verse, I read this, this account, and then I turn to the Apostle Paul's own writings. And the theme is there over and over again. From his very lips, we see these verses. Colossians 1.24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. For your sake, again, being a purpose clause. There's a purpose behind this suffering. Romans 5, 3 through 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. 1 Corinthians 4, 9 through 13 says that the apostles have been made a spectacle before men, fools for Christ's sake. The entire book of 2 Corinthians is basically written in response to critics against Paul's apostleship. They're saying, Paul's not a real apostle. And one of the main points that they have, have provided for that is he can't be a real apostle because look at how much he suffers. Would God let his apostles suffer this much? And Paul basically in, in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 through 29 describes in de great deal his, his experiences of suffering as an apostle and, and it concludes by saying, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. I can go on and on and on. The, the, the topic of suffering became Paul, the apostle Paul's purpose. He wasn't only okay with it. It wasn't, it wasn't an inconvenient side effect, but he understood that this was one of the ways that God was using him. God flipped Saul's idea of his purpose. A man who once aspired to greatness by control and intimidation, now he boasts in weakness and being made a fool before men. A man once possessed by the idea of murder is now consumed with suffering for your sake. When God got a hold of Paul, he completely flipped his perspective. He completely flipped his purpose upside down. <coughs> As we close today, I want to ask you some questions. When was the last time God completely blew your mind? The last time that you sat down with God and you walked away going, I've never thought of that before. I've never, I've never seen it that way. I've never understood that before. The last time you flipped through these pages and something completely new has come to light for you. The last time you've listened to a sermon and something completely new has come to mind. And if it's been a while, or maybe you can't even think of a time, how open are you to that? How open are you to God taking you on a path, on a direction, with a specific goal, with a specific, and, and it might, you might feel like it is exactly the right thing you're supposed to be doing, but how open are you to sitting before God and letting him flip that on its head? Well, he might not. He might, you know, I'm not saying he's always going to do that. So my, my educational background um, is in counseling. So I've done a lot of reading and, you know, different skills that are necessary for for a good counselor. And I remember when I was doing my, my undergraduate, I, you know, I'd go to, I'd get my book list every semester and I'd go to order my books and I laughed because this one book kept showing up and I want to say it showed up in four different classes. And every time I'd see it, first of all, I'm kind of going, well, good, that's one less book I've got to buy because college books are expensive. But the other thing that kind of got through my head pretty quick was that, boy, that must be a pretty important book. There must be something in that book that's really important. So it, it, by about the third or fourth time I read it, I thought, I should probably remember some of this stuff. The topic of that book was listening skills. And I love, I, I think the key phrase that he says in this book is this. He says, most listeners talk too much. Most listeners talk too much. Can I just amend that? Most listeners to God talk too much. Right? When we sit down with God, how much time do we spend listening? How much time do we spend saying, God, what would you have to speak to me today? What would you have to show me today? No, we tend to sit down and go, okay, God, here's my list of things that I need you to look into. I need you to take care of. And I need to go. I've got a meeting. Good talking to you, God. 
Now think of how bizarre that is, sitting down with the creator of the universe, our wisdom is his foolishness, and us spending all the time talking. That'd be like one of my PhD professors at the seminary walking into a preschooler and in, in, into a preschool classroom and saying, well, here's the deal. Um, I think that you, you know, three-year-old, you're, you're more prepared to teach this class than I am. No. It just seems irrational. Most listeners to God talk too much. If our mind isn't blown, it might be because we're not listening. I want you to stand and bow your heads with me. I just want to take a minute to be honest with ourselves. What is our relationship with God about? It is, is it about what we have to offer him? instruction, guidance, direction that says, God, this is what, this is what you need to do today. I, I came to meet with you to let you know, you know, these are the list of things that you should take care of today. Um, I'll check back with in, in with you tomorrow to see if you've taken care of them. Or is it about sitting down with God and saying, God, I do want you to know what's going on in my life. But more than that, I want you to be a, I want you to consume my life. I want you to flip my life, flip my purpose, flip my idea of security. Flip my idea of who you are on its head. What might God flip? What, what might your flip side be if you would allow him to do that?